Hello, everyone. Thank you all for joining us today for a discussion with Dr. Yasser Abu Jamer. Um, I know you've had an incredibly hectic time in DC and a fairly hectic tour, but we really appreciate you made the time to come talk to us today. Really quick, I want to introduce myself to all of you. My name is Mohammed Abu Ghazala, and I'm the Program and Communications Manager here at the Jerusalem Fund. Um, and as a heads up to everyone, we are live streaming on YouTube and Facebook, just to let you all know. Now, there's only two things I need to ask of you before we kick things off. One, if you haven't already, please silence your cell phones. Um, and second, if you haven't signed in already at the front, please go ahead and do, and I will bring around the sign-up sheet um, if you haven't had a chance to take that. Without further ado, I will introduce our moderator for today, who will kick things off, Dr. Edmund Gharib from the Palestine Center Committee. Please tafadal and take it away. Uh, good afternoon. Thank you all. Thanks uh, for coming. It's a pleasure seeing you here. And uh, we have two special guests uh, tonight uh, with us this afternoon, actually. And uh, they're Dr. Yasser Abu Jana and uh, Dr. Nancy Murray. I will say a couple of words about uh, Dr. Murray, uh, and then she will introduce uh, Dr. Yasser. And then we'll take it. I'll have a few questions. And if you have any questions, we would love to hear uh, from you. Uh, Dr. Murray is the president of the Gaza Community Mental Health Program, uh, and she holds a, she had a BA from Harvard University and a PhD also from Oxford University. She has been very active, very much involved in the, uh, supporting uh, the, the activities of the uh, Gaza Community uh, Mental Health Program and uh, working with uh, uh, Dr. Abu Jamia. Uh, she's also, uh, and I want to mention that she's uh, the former director for many years of the American Civil Liberties Union in Massachusetts and the co-founder of uh, the Gaza uh, Mental Health Foundation. Uh, one uh, uh, recently I just found out that she's, uh, we have a mutual friend in common. Uh, Elaine Hagopian. I don't know. I'm sure many of you will know her name or know her, of her. She uh, is a very active uh, uh, individual. She's an excellent scholar. She's uh, who taught about the Middle East and was uh, she was the co-founder of this uh, organization. And she's an amazing, as far as I know, uh, at least that's what I heard. But you can tell us more about this. But uh, and thank you very much for being here and. Welcome uh, to the podium. No, I won't trip. Thank you so much. Um, just one slight change on this. I know it's confusing. There is the Gaza Community Mental Health Program, which Dr. Yasser directs. And then there is this organization, the Gaza Mental Health Foundation, which is a 501c3 group that we in Massachusetts, including Elaine, she was my co-founder, 20 years ago, we founded this and I remain the president. And we really have only one task, and that is to raise funds for the mental health work being done in the Gaza Strip. So let me give a quick introduction because our time is short. Unfortunately, they're due at the airport to fly. Uh, Dr. Jamey is going back to Gaza this evening after nearly a month in the United States. So this is his final port of call in the United States. He is a psychiatrist and works as director general of the Gaza Community Mental Health Program, which is based in the Gaza Strip. He was born in Saudi Arabia, studied at universities in Germany, in the UK, in Lithuania and in Gaza, and has lived in Gaza, Palestine since the year 2000, and has been working with the Gaza Community Mental Health Program since 2004, and directing it after the death of its founder, who many of you may know, Dr. Iyad El Saraj, who made several trips to the US and was a very good friend of mine. Now, he is someone who is guided, the, I'm going to call it GCMHP, that's the Gaza Communal 
community mental health program through very, very difficult years since he assumed its leadership in 2014. And he will tell you about that. I'd like to now um, invite him to come up and talk about the situation there, talk about his own work doing research into violence and its impact on children, especially in families, and also the connection between human rights and mental health, which is so vital to make when we talk about the situation in Gaza. Please. You'll go this way. Thank you very much, Nancy and uh, Dr. Garib, and for the organizers for this, uh, I think, very important event. I, I end the trip at a very dear place, the Jerusalem Fund. It carries a very dear name, which is the name of Al-Quds. And uh, actually, there are many things to say, and uh, perhaps I limit the talk about the conditions in Gaza Strip, because I'm sure that you are well oriented to it. And then maybe we'll have more time for discussions and for the Q's and A's. Well, you know, whenever we, we, we talk about Gaza Strip, certain things come to our minds. You know, some certain things uh, can be given the title of chronic context in Gaza Strip, you know. And this could be three or four different titles. One of them could be the blockade. The other one could be the occupation. The other one could be the socioeconomic conditions, the other one could be the, div the division between the Palestinian people, but certainly when we look at indicators, we need to keep three things in our mind, you know, these are the top important things. One is that two-thirds of the population in Gaza Strip are refugees. This is something that we need all the time to keep in mind. Onorwa said in 2021, I think uh, 1.4 million refugees live in Gaza Strip, Nowadays, uh, as of January 2023, they say that we have 2.3 million residents in Gaza Strip. So imagine two thirds still are, are refugees, but the population is high or huge when we speak about a geographical area of about 140 square miles. That's making up to 14,000 inhabitants per square mile, which is one of the perhaps most densely populated areas in the world. Now that area is not only crowded, but also poverty rates are really uh, staggering. You know, we speak now as 53% uh, of the population live under poverty rate. Well, we need to keep in mind when we speak about poverty rate, that it's not just people at large, you know, but also we have to think of children. 48% of the population in Gaza Strip are children. So we speak about more than 550,000 children who live in families under poverty rate. And, and that is something that is not easy. What do I mean by that is something that is not easy? I would just uh, uh, mention how would uh, a daily life, and this is an example that is very important for, for us to keep in mind, how the daily life of a family in Gaza Strip, you know. So we would assume that on average, we have five people per, per family. That could be, for example, a little bit more than five. That could be, for example, four children on average. Well, you know, four children that uh, should go to school. Uh, Palestinians, they uh, value education. Literacy rate in Palestine is more than 99%. I think it's the highest level maybe in the globe, not in the Middle East. But for those people, you know, to have four children going to schools, sometimes five, there were families with seven, eight, nine, even 12 children, those families would end up with having children going to either morning shift or the afternoon shift. We know that the infrastructure in Gaza is very fragile. There aren't that many buildings when it comes to schools. So basically, it's two schools that share the same building. Two schools means two different uh, groups of children, different groups of teachers, management, etc., but they share the same building. So let's say that the morning shift will begin at seven and will end at 11.30. The afternoon shift will begin at 12 and will end at four o'clock. Now for the mother or the father, having kids going to the morning and afternoon shift means that they have to wake up at least 6 a.m., maybe no later than that. They have to wake up the children for the morning shift. They have then to help them wear clothes, 
help them eat food, and then bis-salama, they should go to the morning school. Well, two or three hours later, they have to work with the second uh, shift of children. Well, once they are set to go out after having a good breakfast, let's say, and uh, being with clothes, the morning shift is coming back. So they return at about noon. They should be, you know, they should uh, have again good meal and then they should start working on their homework. Well, and a few hours later, the afternoon shift comes back. That's assuming that the mother doesn't go to work, which is unfortunately the case in most of the families because unemployment rate, for example, at large in Gaza Strip is about 47 to 53%. It differs based on which quarter you look at. Unemployment rate for women below the age of 30 is 70%. So that's pretty much most of the young families, they have mothers who do not work. But I don't imagine how their life will be if they go to work. But of course, there are many women who still go to work. You add to that that she has to be at work at 8 and then she is back by maybe 2.30. Imagine how, how that look like. And that's not it. Well, imagine that one of the kids is coming back. Let's remember that half of the population is under poverty. Being poor literally means that you will not be, be maybe have more than one set of clothes for the schooling, you know. So imagine that one of the kids came back at like 4.30 with dirty clothes that need to be prepared for the second day morning. Of course, they're a very easy thing. Put them in the washing machine, put them in the dryer, iron them quickly, and then you are set, everything is fine. That will take how much? Two hours and a half, yes? Brian is, is laughing. I know why he's laughing, and I'll tell you why he is laughing. I, I, I'm sitting with Brian and Barbara. He is hosting me in, uh, in DC, and uh, I told him something yesterday. I said it openly. You know, He didn't think of it, but that's how things are. But I'll come to, to that a little bit later. So for the woman to find, for the mother to find that her kids need clothes to be washed, she has to think whether the power supply is on or off. Because at its best, we have power for eight hours on and eight hours off. That means at 10 p.m., it's a golden hour, golden time, 10 p.m., 6 a.m., and 2 p.m. That's where the alternation happens. So if you have a power supply, it will be cut at 10. If you don't have a power supply, then you wait it until 10. And that, that's the case. She has one of two options. If the power is on, she needs to rush and do things before 10 p.m. comes when the power is not there. But if she doesn't have the power supply, then she can either, you know, use the manual way that woman used to do maybe how many decades ago, two, three, four, five decades ago, or wait until 10 p.m. when the power supply comes and then she start with the washing machine. And then we don't have dryers. Laugh about it. Well, the, the, the ironic thing is that, you know, uh, I, I stay with, with friends and I really like doing that. It, it makes more connections, brings more ties. And well, everyone asks me, do you have what, what clothes to wash? I'm in the States for one month. Of course, you cannot have uh, new clothes for every day. That's impossible. No one can financially adopt it unless you work for the, I don't know for whom, but anyway. So the question is, Okay, you have a washing machine. And then my second question, but do you have a dryer that I could make the washing machine? Because I came through the winter, I, I, I go to places where it's like uh, zero Fahrenheit, that's minus 17, 18 Celsius. And each time I bring the question, do you have a dryer? You know, two reactions. One is laughter. Of course, everyone has a dryer in the States. But at the same time, I think, well, it's not only that we don't have dryers in, in, in Gaza. Sometimes you don't have a washing machine. It's right in front of you, but you can't operate it. That's how life in there, you know. So that's how daily life would look, look, uh, would look like, you know, for our women, you know. For the men, it's a different story. You know, imagine a man who is like 45 or maybe 50. 
who is unemployed and he has five kids in the morning and they want to get their money to go to the school, you know, whether to pay for the transportation or just to pay for a sandwich or just to have a new pair of shoes. Again, 500,000 children, more than that, live under poverty, live in families that are poor, and they don't know how their parents are going to be able to afford or accommodate that. Now, this is not the only thing, but during the, uh, on that chronicity with that level of unemployment, that level of poverty, that being two thirds uh, uh, refugees, still you are attacked every now and then. You have days and sometimes weeks of uh, Israeli bombardment that takes place. The famous ones are in 2008, 9, 2012, 20, uh, 14, 21, and 22. But there were more events. Since I came to the States, there were di three different nights when Gaza was bombed you know, through the, the night. It was a little news, you know, perhaps a breaking news for like five minutes and then it disappears because there isn't that many people who get killed or, or like that. But but the question is, that is something that brings Gaza to the news. So it's an ongoing chronic difficult conditions that is complicated with acute attacks that happen every now and then. And of course, we had our share of COVID crisis. And of course, the Palestinian people, you know, they had times when they said enough is enough. They demonstrated to end the blockade on Gaza Strip, to request their rights, to request their right to return, during which we had the Great March of Return demonstrations that ended up with more than 6,000, I think 5,700 people who were injured and tens of thousands who were one way or the other uh, psychologically uh, injured. Now, this could be just words, but I all the time like to bring the attention to this map. It's a map that was drawn or, or made by one of the UN agencies after the May 2021 attacks. Blue circles are places that are like, you know, uh, uh, facilities like health facilities, education facilities, hospitals. And you look at the green, the red, and the yellow dots. These are the areas that were attacked. And that continued for 11 days. The, the greenish ones are like less destructive. The reddish ones are more destructive. And that's how the population felt that there is no safe place. We don't have shelters. People who are displaced, they usually go to live with their relatives or mostly go to UN schools. So imagine if you have 1 million children, that was the count in 2021, and they live for 11 days under this hard circumstances, under bombardment and under attack. And when it's over, when the ceasefire takes place, the wreckage is still there. The drones are still there. Reconstruction doesn't begin. So it's something that keeps reminding people of the traumatic condition and how things were. And that's why it's not a surprise when we hear about the impact. And here I bring some reports that come from some uh, international organization, WHO first said in 2021 that 210,000 people they need psychosocial support because uh, mental health and psychosocial support because they are expected to suffer from severe to moderate mental health illnesses. TDH said that there is the, the need is not only for children, but also for youth, families, teachers, frontline workers. That's almost everyone, you know. They need to receive mental health and psychosocial support services. Well, the most staggering, really, I think, a report that came in July 2022, and I'll bring some some of the details of that. Uh, okay, of that report that came from uh, Save the Children. The title of the report it was Trapped, and that was 15 years after the beginning of the blockade. I think one of these uh, uh, things that they mentioned, the very important one is that there is a deterioration in emotional uh, well-being of the children, more emotional distress that rose from 55% in 2018 to 80% in 2022. If you look into the report, deeply into the report, or, or if you write the details, you will find that 90% of the kids or the children 
are feeling less safe when they are away from their parents. When they speak about caregivers, they say that more than two thirds of the caregivers, they feel that they are not useful or they feel that they are not able, they are not capable or able to meet the challenges that he, or the difficulties that they face. And this is again because of the uh, socioeconomic conditions that I have already uh, mentioned. So at large, I, I would just say that there is a big sense of hopelessness in one hand and helplessness in the other hand. In the other hand. Why you are helpless? Because during the days of the attacks, you cannot really stop them. You cannot really offer a safe place to your kids. You cannot really say that you are protected. And when the ceasefire takes place, there is nothing that you can do in order to reconstruct a building or in order to clean the, 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 the wreckage of destroyed places. It's not in your hand. You feel helpless. It's not in your hand when you don't have a job. You, know, you cannot change that. You cannot change the number of hours that power supply is there. You know. You feel hopeless because you see how things are getting further and further deteriorating. You know, it's a, as Sarah Roy descri describes it very well, we have a, some sort of systematic de-development, you know. As Professor Brian Barber, who is available here with us, and I'm really glad that he is with us today, he says that the, the Palestinian people have their own terms of referring to the feelings that they have, like being destroyed. Broken, that's the word that we use, being broken. So adults, they say that we are broken, you know. That's how we try to talk about things. So within that, let me say, uh, you know, this trauma is called, tra uh, this tour is called or entitled Trauma and Hope. That was the first part of it, which is talking about how difficult things are. The second part, I'm going to talk about the efforts that we really make in order to make that change, make at least the psychological impact of what happens really change. People moving them, trying to move them from despair into hope, from depression into survival. And that's how the Gaza Community Mental Health Program was established in the first place in 1990. I'll try to play, uh, I think this is plugged to the internet. Okay. Oh, that's excellent. Thank you very much. So this is a short video that says the story of GCMHP.
So this is a brief introduction on how we began in the 1990. And as you can imagine, the needs continue to get higher and higher, more and more. That the conditions continue to deteriorate further and further. And uh, today, that's 33 years uh, later, we have a group of more than 100 people who work at the Gaza Community Mental Health Program through our three community centers. And those teams try their best to offer comprehensive mental health services to the population in Gaza Strip. Last year, we have seen more than 4,400 cases. Adults, most of them were diagnosed with depression, 40%. Then the second diagnosis were anxiety, stress, and trauma-related disorders, about 30%. Children who came to the community centers, more than 1,300 children, most of them came with trauma-related disorders. Well, it's not only therapy that we need to do in that case, yeah? Because sometimes treatment alone is not enough. You have to bring more resources. GCMHP through those 100 people will not be able to respond to the needs, the massive needs that are there. So you need to educate school counselors. You need to talk to primary health care practitioners. You need to involve everyone in the society. You need even to talk to parents. You need to talk to, uh, uh, you need to coordinate your work with other agencies. And that's why a lot of our work is through networking and advocacy, lobbying, mobilization. That's why we do a lot of capacity building programs to build the capacities of other uh, uh, stakeholders, you know, other people who can help with us. That's why that's why you need to do a lot of awareness raising because sometimes the community doesn't understand the implication of trauma on people like on children. And here you can see, for example, our play therapy room. One of the techniques that we use for to play with children to recover them, to help them recover and improve is the play therapy. But of course we have art therapy and we have psychodrama. For adults, we apply mostly cognitive behavioral therapy and medication as much as needed. Unfortunately, with time, more medication is needed. And sometimes you need to be more creative on how you can help the population. Of course, we have a toll-free line, but uh, I will try now to show of how you can be creative in responding to the needs of the population. أول كان الإشي غريب علينا وكانوا الآن مش موافقين فمع مرور الوقت تعلمنا شوية مهارات فأخذنا على الوضع في المدرسة إحنا ما كانوش يعطونا رياضة فإحنا لما نجينا هنا وتعودنا على الرياضة هذه صرنا نستنى في الجلسات السنية عشان يجن ونلعب وتعرفنا على صحبات جداد لما نجينا هنا تعلمنا مهارات حياتية مثل الاتصال والتواصل والضغوطات والثقة بالنفس وأيضاً تعلمنا مهارات رياضية مثل كرة الطائرة تعلمنا كثير مهارات زي المهارات الحياتية مثل ضغوطات الحياة واتخاذ قرار والعمل الجماعي وزي المهارات الرياضية مثل كرة الطائرة زي الاستقبال والإرسال من أسفل وأعلى المجتمع بشجع البنات إنهم يروحن على النادي ويلعبن فيه. قبل ما أجي على مسرع كنت ألعب في أشياء. وكانوا الناس يطردوني وكنت أخاف أن مثلاً أنجرح من الأدب في الطريق 
وبعد ما جيت على المشروع صرت الاقي مكان العب فيه ومثلا اصدقاء وانه ارتاح من الضغطات البيتيه ومن الضغطات المدرسيه أنا مبسوطة كثير وبتمنى مشروع يستمع. تعلمنا مهارات حياتية كل عمل كفريق وتعلمنا مهارات رياضية نسدد على الجول أنا مبسوط وبتمنى إنه يضلوا معنا مستمر لأنه طلعنا من ضغوطات المدرسة وضغوطات البيت. This is an example of how Creative, you need to be in order to reach people. This involves training sport coaches on how to offer care, to be a good listener, and to try to just detect children who are feeling more shy, more lonely, more aggressive, uh, less cooperative. And you then you try to help them as much as you could as a sport coach. But this is not your own only work because there is a psychologist who is standing near to you who's trying to do that. This uh, project is now going for about five years and each year we have, I think more than uh, uh, 400 children, half of them are boys, half of them are girls and they all just join this, uh, 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 this kind of uh, activities. And they come from, from Gaza Strip. They come from the most difficultly affected areas, but things end with them being smiling as you have seen. So we try with this uh, group of, of people to help as many people as possible, to be as creative as possible. We are lucky in many times, in many days. However, there is a need to improve the living conditions of the population in Gaza Strip because without that improvement, we cannot continue to work under the current circumstances. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for a very moving uh, presentation uh, this uh, afternoon. I mean, you painted a heart-wrenching picture in a way of what's happening, what people are facing in Gaza under occupation, probably a very difficult circumstances. Uh, yet at the same time, you instilled hope or brought hope and how that is done through uh, sports as one way. And that's, uh, so thank you for, for that. That's, um, I think, an amazing story what uh, we have heard. But one of the things that I had another question I wanted to start with, but I want, uh, one of the things that struck me was you mentioned that there are about 210,000 people who are suffering from severe or moderate uh, mental uh, illness or problems. Uh, what, what percentage of the population is, uh, is this and how does it compare with, uh, let's say, with other countries in the region? Well, the, the figure that comes from different research studies that were made by the WHO globally and different other research uh, uh, institutions, they say that nowadays about 10% of any population that is under conflict is expected to develop severe to moderate mental health uh, disorders, you know. Now, the, and that applies also to Gaza Strip. Uh, let's think that, uh, Gaza Strip doesn't live in Move normal. A closer, please. Yeah, to it. yeah. So Gaza Strip doesn't have normal living circumstances. You know, the we are not in uh, pre and in trauma and in post trauma conditions, and that makes things more difficult. That's why the presentation of trauma and how it affects the people is not as classical as one would really think of. It means that it's not always PTSD. That's why more of the diagnosis that we have is depression. The patient could be more related perhaps to the living conditions that people under, uh, live under that, you know, with the, uh, with the traumatic events that happen in place, it doesn't mean only exposing people to trauma, but it, it also includes the, the, the loss of housing, for example, the loss of living in place, the loss of beloved ones being injured, you know, 
the fear of the future, the uh, more depressive view of the future, that's the feeling of hopelessness, pessimism, you know. So that heavily impacts the population in Gaza Strip, you know. So it shows itself in different ways, not as a classical way of, of showing things. And this doesn't mean that people are not suffering, but it means that suffering represents itself in uh, many different ways. That's uh, amazing. But one of the things, what, what type of challenges do you face uh, on both in your work on a daily basis and in dealing with the, with the environment in a way? I mean, in, in some ways, there are a lot of um, what are cultural taboos sometimes that also no. are part of the problem. But so how do you deal with that? What are some of the main challenges that face you? Well, one of the main challenges is that, you know, uh, people are not all the time aware of what happens to their children, for example, what happens, what, what happens to themselves. Ma trauma sometimes manifests itself in just a problem of concentration, nothing more, nothing less. And that ends up with low academic achievement, low school performance, you know. Sometimes trauma manifests itself in stuttering, for example. Sometimes trauma manifests itself in bedwetting, for example. And imagine if a child is 10 or 11 years old, a boy or a girl suddenly will start bedwetting, you know. Uh, the misunderstanding of the people that or the lack of understanding to this might make them become more, let me say, uh, if I could say, uh, controlling the child, you know, and trying to ask the child, why you are you doing this? You know, why are you wetting your bed, for example, uh, bedding your, uh, yeah, wetting your bed? And then they might end up with punishing that uh, child, but uh, it could be just a sign of uh, trauma and that needs to be addressed that needs to be addressed in a therapy room, not uh, uh, through making the life of the child harder and harder. And that needs the uh, parents to be educated about that. That's why a lot of our work in, includes uh, using, for example, media outlets like TV programs, like radio programs, to talk to the family, to talk to the population, to the adults about how that might imp uh, uh, impact their children. So uh, an another challenge that we face is uh, you know, relapse rate, you know, a lot of cases relapse because you have seen the map that I have drawn, uh, that I have brought. Uh, I mean, for, for populations living in East Khanyunus, for example, in East uh, Gaza, for example, Shijaiya, for example, Khaza'a, for example, or in Beit Hanun at the very uh, northern area, they are exposed with each time to different attacks and the trauma keeps repeating itself. And with any... Uh, bombardment that can cause relapse to the children and to the adults. You know, so relapse is really uh, an issue. And then it's becoming more difficult to help people heal. You know, because the uh, uh, frustration is growing up more and more, especially when uh, uh, unemployment rates are increasing, when the poverty rates are increasing. Sometimes the poverty rate is the same. But the severity of the the severity of the poverty is really uh, uh, changing. It's getting more and more severe. So within that those circumstances, you find it really difficult to to uh, feel that you have you can achieve more than what you can, you have achieved previously. That's why we keep thinking about what we can do. You know, that's why we came with the Sports for Smile uh, project because you have to deal with the circumstances. You have to challenge the realities. If children cannot find means to find hope, then you bring hope to their hands, you know, and you try just to change the atmosphere that they live in. And it works one way or the other, it works. Children themselves, they help us succeed because they are extremely, uh, uh, I would say, uh, life-loving creators, and they help us uh, with our work. No, this is a, this is amazing what you have been doing, and so some of the pictures. But the map was actually fascinating because it reminded me of something. One time I was on a TV program with a senior U.S. Uh, diplomat, and he was talking we're talking about what we brought the issue of occupation, Israeli failure to withdraw from occupied Palestine. He said, "Well, uh, Israel occupied Lebanon; they withdrew from Lebanon. Israel withdrew from Gaza." Uh, but when, uh, but I said basically that, uh, you know, that uh, uh, from Lebanon, they were forced to withdraw. They didn't withdraw because they wanted to withdraw. Uh, and in Gaza, they did not withdraw. If I understand what's going on on the ground, you have Israel still controls the air, the water, and uh, the border, yeah. which is what your map yeah. clearly showed. So 
how has occupation, the blockade actually also, how have they affected the lives of the people of Gaza and how do they affect your work? Well, I can, I can give you a few examples. I think first is the, is the right to movement is a basic human right. You know, you are entitled to live from any place to another place, you know, as long as you have, for example, if you are traveling abroad, as long as you have the visa. But imagine that uh, if you look at WHO statistics on the referral of cases to receive treatment, health care, you know, Gaza Strip is not that much developed when it comes to health services. So, for example, we don't have radiotherapy. We don't have uh, radio diagnostic tools. We don't have uh, a lot of chemotherapy is not available in Gaza. We don't have, for example, uh, cardio surgery, cardiac surgery. We don't have, for example, a neurosurgery. And for those cases, you need to refer them outside. And these services are also available in West Bank or available in East Jerusalem uh, Hospital, like in Al-Maqasid or Al-Muttala or West Victoria. Imagine that during the last 15 years, there is a report from the WHO, a recent one, actually. They said that during that 15 years, 30% of the people who were in need for that kind of uh, uh, health care, they were either denied permit or delayed mm -hmm. permit. You know, Imagine someone who is in chemotherapy with his delayed, you know, doses, like he's not catching up for the dose, what would be his uh, his uh, his therapy? How would like uh, how would that look like? Children who go there for care, only forty three percent. Sorry, forty three percent of them they end up going for therapy, for health care without their parents. So they just have to find another companion because both parents are not good enough to get into Israel, they are not basically given the permit. So imagine if a child is in need for a serious operation or for chemotherapy and he or she will have to endure that without his dad or mom being with, uh, with him. Uh, students who sometimes need to travel abroad, you know, I think in one of the years, eight Fulbright uh, scholarship or the, you know, they had to travel and they prepared, they, they got the US visa, they got the Jordanian uh, uh, visa, but, uh, They've struggled for months in order to get the uh, Israeli approval to get to, uh, uh, to just just pass to Jordan. And these are like 22, 23 year old kids who are just going to get their masters, you know, who are fully supported by the US government, you know, but despite that, it was difficult for them to get uh, abroad. So it's it's uh, it's it's such a thing that, uh, as you said, you know, uh, another example, fishermen. They say that fishing is allowed like for up to 15 nautical miles, but that's not true. That's not the reality. The reality is that uh, boats in Gaza, after I think six or nine miles, they, sh they start uh, shooting that by the, by the Israeli Navy and they have either to retract or sometimes they are arrested. I think in the last, last week, two fishermen were, were arrested. Mm -hmm. Sometimes the engines are confiscated, you know. You know, that engines that help uh, uh, that help boats work. They are not allowed to get into Gaza since the blockade began. I think just last year they started to allow some of them to 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 return. Uh, I mean, to be imported to Gaza. Some of the boats were confiscated, or they were taken to the Israeli side by the Israeli Navy, and they were just allowed to come back. I think a few months ago, they were rusted. I mean, after like ten or fifteen years of just sitting aside, and they are they are coming. Uh, landing uh, or sorry, uh, 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 harvesting land, uh, you know, Gaza Strip, we used to grow our corpse in the eastern side, you know, because that's the relatively less crowded area. You can still grow uh, corpse. But look at the how the bombardment areas were. Would you think that that land is still good for uh, growing corpse, you know? Well, we, we continue to grow corpse there. We continue to eat those corpse. Cancer rate continued to increase in Gaza Strip, and everyone is asking why is that. So there are many ways that can show how the blockade is affecting us. Trade, mm -hmm. we cannot really export oil, olive oil. Last year, we had a lot of oil, oil, oil and olive oil, and there were questions whether we can export them or, or, or not. You know, Before the blockade, we had nice areas that were, uh, uh, we had flowers that were just, uh, harvested and they will they will just go to be sold in Europe. And that continued for years, but then everything stopped and that business is not anymore there. So there are different uh, means. Some factories, mm -hmm. they just closed because they cannot 
bring the repair parts. You know, they have thousands of things that are on the dual use uh, items, they call it, not allowed to get into Gaza Strip. So, I mean, uh, wherever you look in Gaza Strip, right or left, north or, 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 or south, you will find something that is really affected by the, the, the blockhead. I mean, this is this is amazing in a way because of uh, what you have been talking about. And this was under previous Israeli governments. Now we have a very conservative right-wing government in Israel. Uh, how do you think that this government is likely to deal with the situation, with the Palestinians in general and with the situation in Gaza? And how, do you think this is also likely to make your work more difficult, more challenging? I think uh, there are, we hear about a lot of provocative actions, if you could use that word, uh, that, that is made by some Israeli politicians at the moment. I mean, people in the government, that's with the prisoners, for example, Palestinian prisoners in Israeli jail, that's with the Al-Aqsa Mosque, that is with the uh, population in East Jerusalem, that's with increasing the settlements, that's with, you know, uh, attacking the Palestinians in West Bank, like what happened in Jenin, what, you know, since the beginning of this year, more than 48, I think 48 people got killed in West Bank just since the beginning of this year. So, so you can imagine uh, what does that mean? You know, it brings a lot of uh, tension. It means that the future is not going to be as good. It's already bad, but it will be even worse than that. And now we hear that they have, uh, I think, a plan for, for Ramadan. I think uh, the plan should come from Muslims. What you do in Ramadan, you know, how you fast, where you eat breakfast, you know, what kind of food it's in five weeks from now. But it's the, I think the Israeli police are preparing themselves for Ramadan. And it really brings the memories from 2021, how things were in April. It was another Ramadan. And the problems in Sheikh Jarrah were taking place, and the problems in East Jerusalem were taking place. And then they tried, uh, they, they, they decided to raid the mosque in order to evict the worshippers for their safety, for the safety of the worshippers. They were uh, uh, tear gassed and then pulled out, kicked out of the mosque. And you know, you cannot do that to a sacred place. I don't know who has that uh, guts, let me say, to attack worshippers, you know. But that happened, that caused a, a big response, not only from Gaza, but from all Palestinians in every place, because Palestinians are one nation, we are one, one people. doesn't matter if you divide us geographically, but you are still one, one, one people. And uh, that led to the 11 days uh, uh, bombardment that we have seen, uh, we have seen on the uh, on the map. So again, it's concerning to a lot of people. They they expect the worst to come. I don't know if if we can rely on the international community to try to stop that before it happens. I see some efforts are going there, but I am not sure whether these efforts are good enough to stop any future uh, disaster from happening. Yeah. From what you're saying, it looks like we're on the path towards another explosion down the road. Well, unfortunately, that's uh, what I feel. And then more unfortunately, that's what a lot of Palestinian people in, in, in Gaza Strip and uh, feel. It's, it's we, we Our people are well educated. They can anticipate things. And we have had our huge experience living under occupation and seeing how the plans, they take place, you know, how or, or how provocation can lead to. The second intifada began, you know how it began. You know how the first intifada began. You know how the 2021 attacks began. Whenever there is a sacred place like Jerusalem or like Al-Aqsa Mosque, then there is a response. And that's unfortunately what's happening now. You know. Let's take, see if there are any questions uh, from the audience. Would anyone have any questions, any comments? <laughs> Thank you so much for the uh, Could you use the microphone, Hello. please? Thanks. Can you hear me now? <laughs> um, thank you so much for the presentation. It was really informative. Um, I learned a lot. I am actually originally from Yemen, very interested in the idea of helping children recover from war damage, particularly trauma. And if if we borrow the model that you have in Gaza and, and implement it, what kind of recommendations would you give? 
Oh, okay. First, you need to have well-trained uh, psychologists who will follow that. You need to have uh, a system, which means that you cannot really just tell the sport coaches what they should do, and they would do that with the children. You can't do that. First, you need to have a very good foundation for that work, which means a good community mental health uh, practice, multidisciplinary team, psychologist, well-trained psychologist when it comes to uh, the child trauma, well-trained psychiatrist, preferably child and adolescent psychiatrist, you know. And then they can start train sport coaches and what they are looking into, how they can identify problems, how they can try to help children get out of the difficulties and be all the time available for them. And then they have to know how to select children, which ones can be selected. Of course, children with severe issues they cannot join these groups in the beginning you know they need to receive one-on-one -on -one therapy and then they can join one of those um, uh, groups so uh, there are many things that we could uh, talk about and uh, i think the gcmsp is more than uh, open to share such experience you know mm -hmm. yeah that would be very helpful actually thank you so much uh, no, sir. <clears throat> Hi, thank you again, and just thank you, not just for the presentation, just thank you. <laughs> um, I'm interested what your view is um, on the the mental health benefits of resistance, you know, of, of defiance, resistance, and then compared to the 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 risks. You mentioned the the great march of return and all yeah. the the killings and the wound the amputees and yeah. Just how how do you and how do you discuss that with families when the the benefits of resistance and then the, compared to the risks? You know the 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 uh, uh, at one hand we speak about feeling helpless, and the other hand in twenty nineteen people were feeling that we are not anymore helpless because that agency you know their capacity to raise their voice to go to the eastern side and to go to those five. Uh, camps that people were camping and demonstrating every Friday. And that sort of activism brought a lot of positive spirit and positive energy to the population in Gaza Strip. Okay. And that was really important. Uh, however, the cost was really tremendous. It was met with excessive use of, uh, uh, of power. We had many amputations, you know, people like I think more than 80 people with, with, with amputated limbs. Again, 5,700, if I remember, people with, uh, uh, injured with life ammunition, and then tens of thousands who were injured one way or the other. So that sense of agency is, is, is there. Uh, and I think that's uh, how people are. You cannot put people under uh, occupation. You cannot put people in the biggest open air prison, and you do not really expect a response out of them. However, the living conditions are really uh, terrible, and they continue to play a heavy toll on uh, uh, on the population. I think if Professor Barber could 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 respond also to that from his massive experience in dealing with families in Gaza. Um, when I first went to Palestine in 1994, I came with all the presumptions that a mental health professional had those days, and that would have been that after six years of of continuous violence of the Intifada, that the, the children would be a, a wreck. You know, uh, mental health professionals in the West still think that one one experience of trauma can mess you up for the rest of your lives. But our research team went, we went to every single ninth grade classroom in the West Bank. That's, that was, I think, 56. And we interviewed kids and they just were not a, a wreck. I mean, they were they were doing so well, and it really confused me. And so I decided to do a comparison study. And um, at that time, you recall that there was the siege of Sarajevo. Um, and, you know, Bosnia is also a Muslim country with a history of political unrest, et cetera. So I, I went to Bosnia and started interviewing same age kids, male and female, about their experience during that siege. By then, I had interviewed lots, very intensively, a lot of Palestinians, especially in Gaza, about their Intifada experience. 
And I, I can't um, uh, overestimate the difference in the narratives between the two peoples. So the Bosnian kids were talking about real traumatization, um, disconnection, no hope, anger. Um, and, and I concluded that the reason was is that they had no meaning to attach to the violence that, that was surrounding them. So as you may recall, no one in Sarajevo knew from one day to the other that there was gonna be an attack. One day kids would go to school and half their classmates were gone. The served kids had been evacuated. Their parents couldn't explain to them what was going on. And there was no way for them to participate in a cause to, to rebel against or resist this invasion, incursion. The narratives from the Gazans were completely opposite. Cohesion, strength, solidarity, and commitment to be able, to, and pride to be able to contribute to the very clear narrative of the, of the cause of injustice. Well, I have, uh, that was very, very interesting. Thank you very much for your contribution and comments. Uh, but one of the things that I also wanted to ask you about is that uh, there are many people among the young Palestinian Americans, Arab Americans, Americans in general, young people are interested in the issue of mental work, uh, work mental health uh, issues. Do you, what advice do you give them? What do you think, how can they contribute? How can they help perhaps also? Well, uh, you know, I, I have seen many uh, young people during this tour, and this is very encouraging. You know, on the previous tour, not that many young people were there. And then in, in places like uh, Chicago and uh, Michigan, I, I saw even more younger people. And uh, yesterday at Bus Boys, it was really a very interesting event with a lot of young people there. Some of them are Palestinian, some of them are Palestinian Americans, I mean, and some of them are just other Americans. I think it's important for them to uh, really understand what uh, what's happening out there, and they could think how they can. Uh, help. Some of them they say that we we feel alienated. You know, they want to. Even one uh, university student, he she said that. Well, I hope if I have the same feeling as Palestinians do. They said, no, that's not needed, really. No, you don't really need to go through the suffering in, in Palestine in order to be able to help us. You do not need to go through the same difficult conditions. Uh, those young uh, uh, people, first, they need to focus more on their studies. They need to go and do well as our children in Palestine do well. They need to grow as a well-academic population, well-educated population as they uh, need to be. They need to succeed in their path as they should be. And they need to keep Palestinian, Palestine in their minds, you know. And whenever there is a path or a way that they can help, then they should do it. So I, you cannot really extract Palestine from the, their minds. I can assure them of that. But, uh, and there will be all the time means of supporting the Palestinian people. And I think on top of that will be passing the Persian narrative of the story, you know, because it's a lot of people who are not educated and some people are misled really when it comes to the Palestinian uh, case. Uh, and a lot of uh, important work is to educate more the, uh, the population in the States about what's really happening out there and to present the Palestinian perspective of, of how things are there. So just at least to begin from, uh, from that. One of the, 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 if you could give us, you know, I know you've been speaking in a number of cities in the United States, you've visited a number of uh, you know, maybe uh, think tanks or other groups. So I'd be interested in hearing, I think it would be useful for our audience as well to, what are some of your uh, thoughts, uh, your uh, sort of uh, 
you know, reflections uh, about this, this trip? Uh, do you feel that you have accomplished your goals? What was, what did you, what were some of your main objectives in coming here? And do you think you have uh, to a certain extent achieved that? And what's your assessment of the response of the different, of the communities that, and the groups that you spoke to? Well, I think one of the main objectives was to uh, speak about the mental health conditions of the population in Gaza Strip, to talk about the suffering, you know, to talk about the implications of uh, life as refugee, the occupation, the blockade, the attacks that happen every now and then. And I think that message reached everyone. Uh, the other thing is to try to ask people to help as they as as much as they could, and they have spoken to many different people in different positions. The intention is all the time not nice. People are really receptive; they want to help. Some of them are very eager to help. Some of them are not that eager to help because they are afraid that you know uh, talking more about the Palestinian course or talking about what happens in Palestine that might fall them into. Uh, troubles, and I speak in, in different institutions from whatever you can uh, imagine. Uh, but I think uh, uh, my view is this time more people are, are educated, more people know about the issues, more people are prepared to help, more young people are engaged, and I think we are moving in the right direction. You know? More people are uh, oriented to what's happening there. You know? So I am more, more optimistic for the long term but uh, for the perhaps the short term, like in the coming few months or so, I am really uh, concerned about what might happen. How do you think our audience, the people who are listening to you today, how do you think they can help? There are many people, people who are very knowledgeable about the issues, some don't know anything about it. Yeah. How do you think, what do you think uh, they might, how do you think they might be able to help in their own ways? Well, one of the things is to, uh, this is a democratic uh, country, I think they should uh, make use of that democracy, you know, which means to speak up, to write what's in, to, to, to say what's in their minds, to write to the representatives, you know, when they see an injustice, they have the right to ask that that injustice should stop. Something wrong happens or attacks start, then it should stop immediately. People should uh, urge the, the, the US government to intervene, to stop any, uh, actions that are not uh, right. We speak about unilateral, we hear about unilateral uh, actions that are made. We hear that when, 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 when people talk about the Palestinian Authority, but we don't hear that much when the Israelis do things like now they are legalizing, for example, settlements, you know. So, so there is a need to exert pressure on uh, Israel to make it respond, respect the human rights, to end the violations of human rights wherever they are. And I think every person has the right to speak up and, and to pass that uh, message. And uh, if they can support the work of GCMHP through the Gaza Mental Health Foundation, then that would be really uh, interesting and, uh, and nice. And I think I could uh, ask Madam President, you know, to talk so about that's that. A good... Please. Yes, please. We give 100% of everything that is sent to us to Gaza, to the work that Dr. Abu Junay is doing, to three women's groups, which grew out of the work of GCMHP. So please take a brochure. Um, it's You get a tax deductible donation uh, receipt from me personally. And know that all of your funds will get there with our directors covering the overheads. So you could either send a check to our PO box, which is 380273 in Cambridge, Massachusetts, 02238. That check can be made out to the Gaza Mental Health Foundation. Or you could go to our website and pay online, our website being gazamentalhealth.org. But please do support this very important work. Yeah. Uh, well, thank you. Uh, I have, uh, what, I was listening this morning, I have a question. 
I was listening this morning to a congressional hearing, Senate hearing, and where some senators were asking, talking to some big tech companies. Uh, and uh, there were mem families who lost children uh, as a result of uh, misuse or abuse of uh, of the you know the internet and thing. Uh, how has the internet or affected people's lives in, in Gaza and Palestine and in the region? And uh, there are negative as well as positive aspects to it. Could you could you address that? I know it's, we're going a little bit away, but well, in a way it's related. The, the negative ones we all know about them. You know that children may be more uh, less. Uh, they have less time to focus on what they need to look into, for example, into their studies. You know, the internet brings a lot of material out of it is not uh, appropriate for their age, for example. You can get a lot of harassments through the internet and all of those problems that we hear about. However, the internet, when there is enough power and when there is enough internet, could be a very useful tool to educate the people. Our website is there, but we have more outreach through the internet uh, page uh, through which we, uh, I think on a weekly base, we just broadcast uh, uh, an educating material to the uh, community. And uh, uh, sometimes that material uh, can be used through the sponsored, as they say, ads, you know. So this tool can make uh, uh, us spoke to, speak to a wider uh, group of, uh, of population. So this is one of the things that we can usually use. I think it's also important to say that uh, the internet brought a lot of attention to Gaza and uh, brought a different story, you know, to the audience. And that is also very important to speak about that. Well, thank you very much. Thank you for being with us. I know you are traveling tonight. We don't want to delay you anymore, but uh, keep, keep up your great work. And thank you, thank very, you much. very much for being with us. Thank you. This was very uh, an important contribution. We really appreciate it. Thank and you if anybody much. can stay, we have some uh, desserts and coffee or tea. You can please, uh, you're welcome. And thank thanks you. again. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.